How are you? Good to see you. Maybe let's see further out there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Penny, and I am the Chief Learning Officer here with the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. On behalf of our team and our Board of Trustees, I welcome you to the library for tonight's very special event. Before we get started, it's tradition here that we honor our men and women in uniform and the great history of our country by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'd please rise and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Please be seated. So before we invite our guest this evening to the stage, I want to take just a moment to recognize a few special guests who are joining us this evening. Uh, first, we have George Will's sister, Catherine Jorgensen. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Also in attendance this evening is a really special group of youngsters, the 2019 GE Reagan Scholars and their families. This is a group of 18 of our nation's finest high school students, each of whom will receive $40,000 in scholarship funds. Yeah, pretty, pretty impressive. <laughs> So these 18 youngsters were selected from more than 16,000 applicants nationally. So we're excited to have them joining us here this evening as well. Now for our special guest. So George Will is a man who likely needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. I promise I'll keep it brief because like you, I'm really anxious to discuss his comprehensive, his thoughtful, and his remarkable new, new book, The Conservative Sensibility. A few notes about Mr. Will's remarkable career. So in a recent Forbes piece, George Will was described as, quote, one of the most consequential thinkers in the history of the conservative movement. In a review of his book, the National Review said, quote, for some 45 years, Will has been a leading conservative. In my presence, Bill Buckley once greeted Will as my leader. And this is a quote. That's high praise, baby. You might also know that George Will is a big baseball fan. In fact, he's written a couple books on the subject and has had an opening day quiz on the Washington Post uh, website for several years now, which so far as I can tell is primarily designed to make me feel like I know very, very little about the history of baseball. Uh, but baseball offers a useful metaphor for George Will's career. To be at the top of your game for 45 years is incredible staying power. So I did a little bit of research on one of the longest, most successful careers in Major League Baseball. And I have a one question baseball quiz for our audience tonight. Let's see which of you knows your baseball history. Which Major League player played the most seasons of Major League Baseball? I'll give you a hint. He played for the Mets, the Angels, the Astros, and the Rangers. Nolan Ryan, that's right, Nolan Ryan. So Nolan Ryan, who played for 27 seasons. He played in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So how are Nolan Ryan and George Will similar? Well, George Will began his career with the Washington Post in 1974, and by 1977 had received the Pulitzer Prize for commentary. Nolan Ryan, only a few seasons into his career in 1972, was selected to his first All-Star team and led the league in strikeouts. So they both had early success at the very highest levels of their profession. Over an incredibly distinguished career, George Will has received too many awards and accolades to list in the short time we have allotted for this introduction. But he was named one of the 25 most influential journalists in Washington by the National Journal in 1997. Over the course of his own incredibly distinguished career, Nolan Ryan won too many awards and accolades to list here, but was selected to the Major League Baseball All-Century Team in 1999, receiving the most votes of any pitcher. So in addition to early triumphs, both have had sustained success over time. And finally, Nolan Ryan, whose career included playing in four decades, was known for his unrivaled power on the mound. His fastball is perhaps one of the most legendary and devastating pitches in the history of baseball. He threw seven no-hitters and struck out 5,714 batters in his career, both records that most people feel will never be broken. 
1993, his final season in the major leagues, at the age of 46, his powerful arm finally gave out. He tore a ligament in his elbow during a game. After tearing his ligament, he wanted to throw another pitch just to see if he could go any further. Without a functioning elbow on his throwing arm, his final pitch was 98 miles per hour. <laughs> George Will, whose career has also spanned more than four decades, is much like this. His newest book, The Conservative Sensibility, has been called a blockbuster. If a book so thoughtful and learned and graceful can be called a blockbuster. Uh, and another reviewer said that to say Will wrote a brilliant book brings new meaning to understatement. On Amazon, it's a top three bestseller in three different categories. Suffice it to say, our guest tonight is still throwing the intellectual equivalent of 100 mile an hour fastballs. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming George Will to the stage. So thank you very much. I played baseball briefly and badly. <laughs> My career peaked in Little League <laughs> in Champaign, Illinois, where I played for the Mittendorf Funeral Home Panthers. <laughs> <laughs> Our color was black. <laughs> Jeez. I feel like we could spend the next hour just talking about that. That'd be a, 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 do funeral homes still sponsor the league teams? I, I, sure. It seems very morbid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my, my first question to you about, about this book. This, this is a book. How long did it take you to put this together? This is incredibly detailed and thoughtful and well-researched. Well, three years of intense work while also writing 100 columns a year and doing television and all the rest. Uh, in a sense, though, I've been working on it for 10 years. In another sense, it goes back to my doctoral dissertation in the 1960s at Princeton, which was titled Beyond the Reach of Majorities, and it's about whether America is about majority rule or about liberty, because they're not the same thing. And I suppose, in a way, it began uh, when I grew up in central Illinois, uh, marinated in the spirit of Lincoln, uh, not that far from Dixon, Illinois, of, uh, of great memory here to this group. And uh, Lincoln, by local lore, was in the Champaign County Courthouse. He was a traveling, very prosperous railroad lawyer at the time. In, 19, in 1864, 1854, sorry, when he learned of the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was sponsored by an Illinois senator, Stephen A. Douglas, and it attempted to solve the vexing problem of what to do about the question of could slavery expand into the territories. Kansas Braxton Act said, we'll just vote on it. <clears throat> People, Stephen Douglas said, you vote slavery up, vote slavery down, it's a matter of indifference. What's important is majority rule. Lincoln's recoil against that, implacable, subtle, unrelenting, launched him on his great career. And uh, Lincoln said, America is not about just about majority rule. It's not about a process majority rule, it's about a condition liberty. So uh, I think that was uh, set me on, on the path to this book, and uh, it set, I think, uh, Ronald Reagan, growing up in the same Lincoln country, set him on his career. Absolutely. Well, so I want to I want to go back to that. You, you talk about Lincoln, and in the book, you you reference Lincoln quite a bit, yes. uh, and also Lincoln's reverence for the Declaration of Independence, and, and it specifically. Um, but I want to I want to get to the title and then come back to that. But uh, so the conservative sensibility. You do a, a very interesting job of defining conservatism and, and what it is that conservatism seeks to conserve. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little sure. bit about that. Uh, by sensibility, I mean more than an attitude, but uh, less than an agenda. This isn't a book telling people what to think. It's a book suggesting how to think about the complexities of government and society. It's about the proper scope and actual competence of government. The book is dedicated to the memory of the man for whom I cast my first presidential vote in 1964, Barry Goldwater. Anyone here old enough besides me to have voted for Goldwater? <laughs> Good for you. Uh, Goldwater, of course, it, it was the 1964 campaign in which uh, Goldwater was given a speech to give. 
And he said, uh, it doesn't sound like me. It was probably too intelligent, frankly. Bo Barry did, was not a, a thinker. He was an activist. He said, get Ronnie to give it. And Ronald Reagan gave what is now known as the speech late in the campaign, and it launched Ronald Reagan to the governorship and then on to the White House. Uh, Barry Goldwater knew he was going to lose because the assassination of John Kennedy meant that the American people would have had to have had three presidents in 14 months for him to win. But Goldwater said, there is such a thing as constructively losing. Uh, well, in, in this sense, he, he, he was going to reinfuse the vocabulary of the founding fathers, limited government, natural rights, separation of powers, back into government, and into the Republican Party. I like to say Goldwater didn't lose in 64, he won, it just took him 16 years to count the votes. <laughs> and uh, what, what I want to do in this book is answer the question, and it's the one most frequently asked of conservatives, what do you want to conserve? And the answer is the American founding. Natural rights, the doctrine that rights come before government. First come rights, then comes government. The most interesting word in the Declaration of Independence is the verb secure. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and governments are instituted to secure those rights, not to give us our rights. Then the founder said, human nature is fixed, so government can't try and change human nature with progressive plans to make people progressively better uh, creatures. And third, to make government safe and limited, we want the separation of powers. When the founders went to the sweltering Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, they didn't go to create an efficient government. The idea would have horrified them. They wanted a safe government. So they have three branches of government, two branches of the legislative branch, each branch with a different constituency and a different electoral rhythms, veto, veto override, supermajority, judicial reviews, all kinds of ways to slow the process down. James Madison, another hero of mine and the hero of the book, said, in our, our, our democracy, majorities should rule, but they should be majority opinion should be filtered and refined and slowed and made more intelligent and reasonable and less passionate by filtering it through these institutions. Uh, as a result, it, it, people say, gosh, it's hard to pass laws. And the founders said it's supposed to be. So you don't do things precipitously. Uh, sometimes it results in gridlock. And I, I actually think gridlock's not an American problem. It's an American achievement <laughs> because it is to slow things down. I can think of nothing the American people have wanted intensely and protractedly they didn't eventually get. So, so to the, the, the question of gridlock, I know a lot of politicians kind of campaign on it, and this is not a new campaign promise, but I'm going to go to Washington and get things done. Or are you saying that it would be better if they said, I'm going to go to Washington and, and get nothing done? We're just going <laughs> to... Well, not nothing, but we're going to get a few things done. Uh, people say, gee, during the Obama administration, there was gridlock, nothing got done. The biggest financial regulation or legislation since the 1930s in Dodd-Frank, the biggest social um, program uh, enriching the entitlement state since 1965, since Medicare, was the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. You may not like those, I'm not fond of either, but that's getting things done. Big things still happen in Washington. Well, so I want to pick up on the idea of, of big things getting done, because one of the themes that you really talk about quite a bit uh, in getting back to the founder's intent is the shifting role of the executive over time uh, and how this has grown substantially from, you know, kind of the, Washington as the president, as the executive, who didn't come in and say, this is my agenda and I'm going to roll out, you know, my first hundred days to what the executive has become over time. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and your, your thoughts on well, that. Well, if my hero is James Madison of Princeton's class of 1771, the villain of the piece is Woodrow Wilson of the uh, class of uh, 1879. Woodrow Wilson was the first president to criticize the American founding, which he did not do peripherally, did root and branch. First, he said to the American people, do not read the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. They'll just mislead you because it's all that natural rights stuff. 
and that, will, that doesn't leave an ample scope for government. And he said the separation of powers was all right a long time ago when there were only four million Americans and 80% of them lived within 20 miles of Atlantic tidewater on the fringe of the North American continent. But now, said Woodrow Wilson, we're a great nation united by steel rails and copper wires, and we need a forceful government at the head of which should be an emancipated executive and a marginalized Congress so that presidents can uh, act with dispatch without this encumbrance of the separation of powers. Well, uh, that was Woodrow Wilson. Next came, in the realm of strong presidents, came the uh, man who first came to Washington to be Woodrow Wilson's Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt, using the mar marvelous uh, means of communication, that, in his day, the radio, which, believe it or not, was as exciting to Americans and as important to Americans as the internet is in our day. Uh, he used radio, then came television with Lyndon Johnson, the next strong executive. And um, the state, progressives said, well, we like strong presidents because they'll always be liberals. <laughs> then in, uh, at noon, January 20th, 1981, uh, they got a conservative president and one just as good as uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was president in Ronald Reagan's politically formative years, just as good as Roosevelt was at using mass communication. And uh, the great communicator was a conservative this time. Well, it's interesting, too, uh, that the speech that you mentioned, the, the Goldwater speech that Ronald Reagan gave, he actually used an FDR phrase, uh, the rendezvous with destiny. Yes, he did. Uh, which is interesting. And he also said in that speech, today, uh, it is almost as though our rights are dispensations from government, and that is essentially what the progressives now say. And so Ronald Reagan, in, uh, what, 45 years ago, was uh, spot on. Excellent, so. 55, my math is terrible, 55 <laughs> years ago. Um, so to follow up on that, one of, the, one of the things you point out about the Constitution, uh, one, the, the way that the president has, for some time now, the office of the president has been perceived is as kind of the primary driving force in, in what happens uh, nationally. Yeah. It was not intended that way at all. Uh, it's not even, you know, the, the, the first article is about Congress. It, it should have been Congress um, that, that drives the legislation. Um, and, and so in your mind, is, is there a way to, if, if the idea is to conserve the principles of founding America, a, to get back to a point where Congress is kind of the driving force of the... the we have to hope so, because the first substantive words of the Constitution, meaning the first words after the preamble, are all legislative power shall be vested in the con uh, Congress of the United States. Unfortunately, Congresses for 80 years now have been divesting themselves. They have no right to do this. And the court, I hope, will soon begin to enforce the non-delegation doctrine. But they've been giving powers to the presidents that the president should not have. The power to impose tariffs, which are taxes, uh, without, Congress's, without Congress being involved. The power to take this country into wars, hither and yon, without uh, Congress being involved. The power to uh, take appropriations appropriated for one purpose and repurpose it and spend the money for something else. Congress is so busy. We've had 435 members of Congress for about a century now. Uh, the size and busyness of, of Congress, uh, of the government, has increased 50-fold since then. They can't keep track of it, so they, they just keep legislating, intruding into American life, and delegating enormous amounts of discretion to what's now called the administrative state. Uh, I think the court is showing signs of wanting to stop Congress from delegating these powers. I think also that uh, Congress is beginning to feel a great sense of, of, uh, of institutional pride, which Madison assumed they would have. He's, he assumed these uh, constructive rivalry between the branches would hold them in check. Excellent. And one of the things you point out in the book, which is really interesting, is about the way that the office of the executive is constructed in the Constitution, is there are actually very few enumerated powers to the president. 
uh, which if you take one way, you could mean, okay, the president has very few powers. If you take the other way, well, if it doesn't say I can't do it, yeah, then it I can do precisely. it. Precisely. Uh, Article 2, which enumerates the president's duty, half of Article 2 is about how to elect the president and how to remove him if necessary. What it mostly says about the president, he, he shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. It's called the take care clause, which means he is institutionally secondary. He is responding and executing the laws done by the Article I by the Congress. But you put your finger on it. Teddy Roosevelt came along and he said, I have a stewardship idea of the presidency, which is I can do anything I'm not explicitly forbidden to do. And that was the beginning of the modern executive. Um, so a question for you. So if you, if you kind of compare historically and, and we think through uh, the great presidents in the history of our country and how they might have approached that office of, of the executive, uh, if you started with Washington, what would Washington think about what has become of the office of the presidency? Oh, my. Uh, <laughs> until the 20th century, almost all presidential rhetoric was in writing, and it was directed to the legislative branch. It was directed to Congress. Uh, Jefferson was the last president before Woodrow Wilson to deliver the State of the Union address in person to Congress. Jefferson didn't like the sound of his own voice. Wish we had more presidents like that, but uh, <laughs> he didn't like the sound of his own voice, and he thought it was kind of monarchical for a president to stand up above Congress and declaim to them. So he sent it up in writing. Every president did that until Woodrow Wilson, who thought no one could hear quite enough of his voice. And uh, then along came radio and all the rest. But uh, Presidents are, are, can work with Congress. One of Ronald Reagan's great achievements, of course, was the tax reform of 1986, in which he said, he went on the air, he gave a nationwide speech, and he said, write some letters to Dan Rostenkowski, who was the head of the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives, a Democrat, and they worked together and got it done. Because you, you mentioned, too, the um, FDR's uh, facility with, with radio and, and really being the first president to embrace that form of, of national communication and that he used it to leverage a sense of intimacy with yeah. the American people. When he gave his first fireside chat on the radio after he was inaugurated president in 1933, he began his chat with two words that don't appear in the transcript of the radio broadcast at the, in the library at Hyde Park. He began with the words, my friends. Now, no president ever, imagine George Washington or Grover Cleveland or anyone else addressing the American people as my friends. Uh, I don't want presidents to be my friend. I just don't. I, 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 just, I just think that's the wrong view of political officers in a republic. They're not supposed to be our friends. They work for us, actually. And uh, we pay their salary. And uh, we renew their lease once, if they think they've earned it. Uh, but this represented the change. Ere long, we had Bill Clinton saying he feels our pain. He doesn't, but uh, <laughs> he said he did, and people seemed to like that. And I, 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 Ronald Reagan seemed to me mastered the art of, of uh, being as ubiquitous as modern presidents have to be, given the technology, but maintaining a kind of uh, gravity and dignity of the office. Uh, so I want to come back to right before the, the office of the presidency shifted. So if you look at the history of the presidency, we have some you know, huge kind of national figures in, in Washington and Lincoln. And then you pick up with TR. And there, between Lincoln and, and Teddy Roosevelt, there's not a slew of great presidents. Mm -hmm. Maybe Ulysses S. Grant yeah. uh, you know, and captured the national imagination in a way that no other president in between then did. Um, one of the pieces that you pointed out, we, we talk often about uh, an uninformed electorate and, and uh, a lack of uh, interest and that sort of thing, despite the fact that, you pointed this out, that between Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, those were some of the highest years of voter turnout in the history of our country. Um, so what do, you th do you think there's a connection between political engagement and a less vigorous executive? There is, and, and also at, at that time there were political machines you know, the political parties turned out the vote, uh, partly because uh, if you needed a turkey at Christmas, they'd, I'd 
the party would give you the turkey. And if your cousin needed a job, uh, Tammany Hall would give him a job. Now we have a welfare state and uh, no one needs the parties to, to give them a turkey or a job anymore. Yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I thought um, was interesting when you're talking about Woodrow Wilson, uh, you, you said uh, it's telling that what Wilson hoped for in a government was wieldiness. And, and yeah, he wanted a government that could be wielded easily by a strong president. Uh, again, going against all that Madison's constitutional architecture was supposed to provide. Madison has a wonderful phrase. He says, of course, we're all Democrats. We all want democracy, but he wanted mitigated democracy. That is democracy with the edges worn off, democracy with the passions tamped down, democracy with uh, the refinement of opinion. Uh, George Washington famously described the Senate as the saucer into which we pour our tea so that it will cool. The sense of slowing things down and cooling passions. To, for the founders, passions were a problem and you didn't try to, you didn't try to arouse them. Indeed, the word leader or leadership appears 13 times, just 13 times in the Federalist Papers, once as a cursory passing mention to, to those who were leaders of the revolution. The other 12 times, the references to leaders were disparagements because leaders for the founders were people who, did, who manipulated the popular arts, as they said, and they were afraid of demagoguery. So I want to pick up on the idea of wieldedness and, and what FDR did with that idea of, the, of wielding the, uh, the yeah. administrative state. Um, and he made a shift. Uh, you mentioned the word secure as being one of the key phrases um, in the Declaration of Independence that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. We hear the word secure again in secure the blessings of liberty in the preamble to the Constitution. That word secure um, is, is, and you pointed out the difference between being securing these rights and giving these rights. Right. And FDR, when he talked about kind of the new Bill of Rights, it, it, he made a shift, at least in the, in the way that it was perceived. Right? When he was campaigning in 1932, he gave a speech at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, where, come to think about it, I'll be speaking tomorrow night, I think I'll mention this bad speech he gave, um, <laughs> in which he said part of the New Deal was a new compact with the American people, that they would give the government certain powers and the government would give them certain rights. Now that is exactly wrong. Uh, that's, that goes against everything the founders and Ronald Reagan stood for. Uh, it, it, and so in that time, so we've seen the, the growth of the administrative state. Yes. One of the, the facts that I, I just couldn't believe when I, when I read it. So Congress's job is to pass laws and then we have these things called regulations, which are not necessarily passed through Congress, but they're through these various administrative agencies. You, 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 quote, you said there are more than 300,000 criminal, criminally enforceable regulations that have been created. Yeah, no one knows how many criminally enforcing regulations there are. That is, no one knows how many hundreds of thousands of ways you can violate the law. Now that's f fundamentally not the rule of law. You only have the rule of law when the law gi gives you due notice of what is required or prescribed. If you walk into the office of Senator Mike Lee of Utah, who by the way is the son of the, of the Solicitor General Lee in Ronald Reagan's administration. Walked into Mike Lee's office, you'll see two stacks of paper. One's about that high. And those are all the laws passed by Congress in a given session. The other stack of papers is eight feet high. And those are the laws and uh, those are the rules and regulations churned out by the federal bureaucracy in the same period. Now that tells you four inches eight feet where power has actually gone and how much, how much we've, we've lost accountability as this disappears into the, into the vast blob of the bureaucracy that actually makes the laws that govern how much the rules, how much water can come through our shower heads, how much water can go through our toilets. Try and think of something that isn't regulated by the federal government, just try. Or things that you could be thrown in jail for potentially. Right? Exactly. That uh, you might not know about. Uh, so we we talked a little bit about the executive branch and, and Congress. We haven't talked about the judicial branch, and you, and you talk quite yes. about them in, in this. And uh, I think a, a couple things. One, you you use an Al Alexander Hamilton quote where he describes the judicial branch as the least dangerous branch. 
just wonder if you could comment on that. Well, he's, it, Hamilton said the, the judiciary is the least dangerous branch because it has neither the sword, meaning force, nor the purse. It doesn't control spending. And I think conservatives have over the years made a mistake in urging Congress to be deferential and judicial restraint regarding the legislative branch and regarding state legislatures. I understand why this is so. The conservatives reacted against some of the more freewheeling rights creations, Roe v. Wade in particular, on the part of the Warren Court. But I believe that often judicial deference to the legislative branch is a dereliction of judicial duty. I say in the book that the, I have a whole chapter called The Judicial Supervision of Democracy, in which I say that the third most important American in our public history after Lincoln and Washington was John Marshall. Because John Marshall understood that if you're going to have a written constitution and if it's truly going to constitute something, it, you must have judicial review, which he invented and, and legitimized, uh, in order to lay questionable acts of the Congress next to the Constitution, and if they're discordant, the Constitution prevails and the act of Congress must be overturned. Uh, I think uh, most progressives had pioneered the rhetoric of judicial restraint because they wanted the government unfettered by judicial re restraint by, uh, by the Supreme Court. Oliver Wendell Holmes, who uh, was the great hero to the progressives, said, if the American people want to go to hell, I will help them, it's my job. <laughs> and he went far toward doing that um, by urging the court to get out of the way. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, carried this one step further when, when the court still was doing its duty in enforcing the non-delegation doctrine and striking down New Deal regulation as it should have done, uh, it last struck down, the Supreme Court has not struck down a, a, a law on, ex, on too much delegation since 1935. Roosevelt, after 19, he was elected, re-elected in 1936, tried to pack the Supreme Court, a really pernicious idea that is now supported by half a dozen uh, Democratic presidential candidates. They should be aware of the following. The country was so alarmed by this and by his attempt in the 1938 midterm elections to purge Democrats from his own party, to purge those who had opposed him, the voters sent all those people opposed by Roosevelt back to Congress. And in doing so, they swept in enough conservative Democrats and Republicans that there wasn't a liberal legislating majority in Congress between 1938 and 1965 when, as a result of the landslide against my man Goldwater, there was a liberal legislating majority in Congress. But by the curious dialectic of our politics, that liberal legislating majority put into Congress by the anti-Goldwater landslide so uh, in, appalled the American people with their ex the excesses of the Great Society legislation that uh, we were on our way to uh, the Reagan presidency. In, in question for you, so the, the Great Society legislation um, we talked about the rise of executive power, and, and one of the things that strikes me is why executive power has risen over years is the, the idea of war uh, and the idea of taking these warlike powers, which originally were confined to war, being commander in chief, and then declaring war on things like poverty or drugs or you know whatever else it may be. Cancer, cancer, or drugs. Yes, uh, uh, we we, decla we declare war on everything except wars. Uh, the last time Congress passed a declaration of war was June 5th, 1942, when they passed declarations of war against Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, just tidying up some of the legalities in the midst of the Second World War. We've had many wars since then, and know that Congress never declares wars because Congress simply isn't involved. You open the paper today and they say, will the president go to war against Iran? Not a whisper of the fact that the power to declare war is rests in Congress. Not a whisper of the fact that the founding fathers said presidents can act without Congress using military force only to repel an imminent danger of immediate attack on this country. 
So we've completely lost that. What, 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 yeah, what do you think it'll take to get back to a state where Congress embraces and, and, and takes back that power? Well, people, what happened was in the decade after the Constitution was written in, in uh, 87, in the 1790s, something uh, 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 suddenly appeared that the founders neither anticipated nor wanted political parties. And one thing leads to another until in 2019, or in the 21st century, when Democrats control the Congress and the presidency, the Democrats in Congress consider themselves team players, subordinate team players supporting the president. Same is true with Republicans. It's no difference and it's equally pernicious. Uh, instead of institutional pride, instead of saying the Senate has its own opinions and its own dignity and uh, it's, it's a rival in a sense to the presidency, we have this, what Madison tried to create, this tension between them that would make government safe. Uh, that equilibrium of forces is now broken down. And what will be required is that we begin to elect people to the Senate and to the House who think of themselves first as legislators and secondarily as team players with the president uh, to re reestablish institutional dignity. One of the things I favor uh, is, and I make the argument for it in here, is term limits so that people will think of the next generation and not the next election. Do you, do you think we'll ever get back to the stage where we, I, I just can't imagine a president in the modern era running on the campaign of, I'm going to be less powerful, I'm going to do less for you than uh, anyone. I just. Well, <laughs> Ronald Reagan, while he was being sworn in at that noon on January 20th, 1981, while he was being sworn in, the, the curator in the White House was taking down a portrait of I've Forgotten Who and hanging up in the cabinet room the portrait of Calvin Coolidge. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a great admirer of Calvin Coolidge who'd said just that. Calvin Coolidge once said, it is a very great advantage in a president that he know that he is not a great man. It's a source of safety for the country. Uh, people said, complained with, uh, about Ronald Reagan, H.L. Mencken and some others said, the trouble with Coolidge was he turned the White House into a dormitory. Well, you know they made the same complaint about Ronald Reagan. They said he went riding too often and he took naps, which he didn't, by the way. Uh, and he always took a stack of work up to the residency after a long day in the Oval Office. But uh, a president who, who doesn't think that he is the center of our universe around which everything is a, is a source of national health, uh, the current president, I don't want to talk about, but the current president has now taken to calling Joe Biden sleepy Joe Biden. I wouldn't mind a sleepy president. <laughs> <laughs> Just to sleep on the job. And <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I want to I ask you a couple of questions, um, and then I'll, I'll go to our audience in, in maybe a couple of minutes here. So if you have a question, think about it, and I will have a, a staff with microphones ready to go. Uh, but I also want to ask you, given that my, my own personal background is in teaching and education, you, you have a whole extensive chapter on the aims of education. Um, and I think one of the things that's often decried is, you know, in, in, our, in our country, the, the focus that we've had on civic education and the importance of, on American history has been lost. Um, so in, in your estimation and in your words, what, what can we do uh, through our system of education to help get back to that, that state of what the founders intended for this? Well, we have, to, we have to use institutions outside the educational system, such as the Reagan Library and the presidential libraries that do a, a really good job. You're in charge of this here, so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is, when conservatives woke up after the Second World War and realized they didn't have academia, they didn't have the media, they didn't have the support of Hollywood. They said, well, we'll build our own intellectual infrastructure. The think tanks, American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, Heritage Foundation, all the rest. Well, that's, you, you can't build an alternative public education system. You have to do something to, to revive schools that teach American history as something other than a, a series of atrocities and defeats. 
There's a wonderful, new, you know, so many kids go to school and they are taught American history from a man named Howard Zinn, uh, who, who never saw an American episode he thought well of. Uh, but a man at the University of Oklahoma named William McClay has just published a text that I think is going to begin to be used in more schools celebrating the American achievement, which is, I mean, America's the best thing that ever happened, in my judgment. Uh, <laughs> But the aim of education, see, we live in an age of rage and of constant disparagement. And when people think critical faculties are only exercised when you're being critical of something, we need to teach people how to praise. There is so much praiseworthy in the American past and in the American present that uh, Teaching people to praise teaches them that you're not diminished when you praise something excellent or someone excellent. And uh, the, the American history, Lord knows we've had our faults. We're a big country with big faults and big problems, but uh, this is a, a, a luminous story and we're still a nation in which people are fighting to get in, not trying to get out. Yeah. And in, in, in your chapter on education, I just want to finish with a couple quotes and get your reaction. One, you, you quoted Lincoln's first inaugural, uh, talking about the, uh, the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. The crucial word there is memory. You have to, a nation that that doesn't have a memory of its past, has no idea where it came from, and therefore no idea where to go. It's not anchored to the past. And again, the, the point of the conservative sensibility is to say, I know the world has changed, and I know the country's changed since there were four million of us on, on the fringe of the North American continent, but the premises of the country were right then, and they're still right. Excellent, it reminded me of a, a quote from President Reagan's farewell address, is uh, the, the kind of, it, uh, it inspires what we do in education here, where we said we've got to teach history based not on what's in fashion, but what's important. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I'm warning of an eradication of the American memory, that same hearkening back yep. to Lincoln, that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Yep. Um, and the last question for you, then we'll get some from, so one of the things you advise is that students should develop a talent for pessimism. Yes, uh, not fatalism. Fatalism is despair and passivity and the belief that vast impersonal forces rule the world. History with a capital H, that's what progressives believe. Progressives are all saying so-and-so is on the right side of history, as though history is a thing and you have to get on its good side and, 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 and become obedient to history. No, by pessimism I only mean we ought to be aware of how many things can go wrong in the world and how fragile the institutions of freedom are and of civility and civil society. As Ronald Reagan said over and over again, you, 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 can, you, you can only, you, you, liberty can be defended all the time. You lose it once and it's gone. Uh, so the stakes of politics are always high. Excellent. So I'm going to pause my questions there. I would imagine our audience has a number of questions. So if you have a question for Mr. Will, please raise your hand. Uh, we have staff located throughout the auditorium here with uh, microphones. Um, and so, uh, there oh, we go. sounds like we're going to start right here. Okay, about uh, uh, Congress taking back some of its duties and because of institutional pride. Do you ever see that happening with the tariffs? I mean, the Democrats, I think, like what Trump is doing more than the Republicans with the tariffs. Yeah, the D Democrats like uh, protectionism because uh, it's big, bossy government. How does government get bigger and bossier than telling people what they can buy, in what quantities, and what prices? That's, I mean, that's everything. Uh, 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 they, well, a few Republicans are, are saying, wait a minute. For example, uh, when pre the, this president has imposed certain tariffs by declaring an emergency, 
So Senator Portman, a Republican of Ohio, said, well, if, if this is a national security emergency, let the Defense Department declare it, not the Commerce Department, for Pete's sake. Uh, Pat Toomey, Republican of uh, Pennsylvania, is also for clawing back some of these powers by restricting the ability of presidents to declare uh, emergencies. Chuck Grassley, about 84 years old, guy who says, I'm just a farmer from Butler County, Iowa. He is a tough cookie, and he's been around a long time. He is right now, in my judgment, the most important senator. He's chairman of the Finance Committee, and he says, uh, uh, Unless some of these tariffs are lifted, we're not going to uh, vote on some of the, the trade agreements the president wants. So again, this is the way the system's supposed to work. And it's a, there's a sort of physics to our politics. For every action, there should be an equal and opposite reaction. And I think it's beginning to occur in Congress. Another question over here. You've described yourself as an amiable, low-voltage atheist. And I'm wondering what role you think religion has played in the conservative movement in the past and what it will play going forward. Religion has played an enormously important and noble role in American history since the Mayflower Compact was, was enunciated. I mean, people came to this country, <coughs> excuse me, on a religious mission, an errand into the wilderness, came here to, to escape established churches and religious bigotries and religious wars. Uh, and it's a, a, a tremendously creative force in, in American life. My grandfather was a Lutheran minister in uh, Pennsylvania. So, uh, and, and I am married to a ferocious Presbyterian. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure there's any other kind. But uh, uh, re religion has, the churches and synagogues have, have uh, given us this thick civil society of mediating institutions that mediate between the individual and the state. So we're not just naked with the state and nothing in between us and the state. Uh, there, we have enormous religious diversity, including a whole lot of people like me who don't have uh, religious affiliation. But uh, we all get along and the Republican Party, what, Ronald Reagan's greatest achievement as a politician was this fusion of free market, libertarian, small government cap, uh, uh, conservatives with social conservatives who worried, rightly, that when, when, the, when you have limited government, you need the institutions of civil society to equip people with the virtues to use the freedom they have under limited government wisely. As Edmund Burke famously said, before we congratulate people on their freedom, we should see how they use it. And uh, so uh, religion has and always has had and always will have a great role in American life. Okay, I know we have one here, and then we have one up front here, and then we'll go back there. Oh, um, uh, speaking to a fellow independent, I would, I'd like to hear what your uh, thoughts are on, are we eternally married to just two political parties? I mean, there's been, is there any hope of having, having any diversity outside of just these two parties, and then maybe speak to the, well, what a, the displaced loyalty people have for party over country. Well, uh, <clears throat> it's pretty hard to have a third party when you have in 48 of the 50 states the winner-take-all allocation of electoral votes. 1992, Ross Perot got 19% of the, of the popular vote, but zero electoral votes because he didn't carry any states. Uh, so, so, I mean, the Republican Party didn't always exist. It, it was born out of the rubble of the Whig Party that foundered on the issue of slavery. So parties are not immortal. Uh, I'm not saying that the Democratic Party will always exist or the Republican Party will always exist. I'm just saying that there probably won't be a third party. We're, we're, never, we're not equipped for that. Um, I think our, our, uh, the Republican Party has had many permutations over the ages. The Republican Party in the late 19th century was all for protectionism until it led to a lot of corruption and crony capitalism, which inevitably it does. Uh, so um, 
I, I think that we, there will be contests at all times. There's one going on in the Democratic Party right now over the soul of the Democratic Party. Is it a progressive party or is it a more traditional centrist uh, party? But uh, the party, the contest will always be within the parties, I think. I don't see a third party coming along. Okay, we'll go here and then back there and then over there. So, uh, I, thank you. I, I think your, your opinions of the current administration are known, but tomorrow night, 20 out of 24 declared. Others will start discussing 2020. I wouldn't put the word conservative with any of them, but do you believe any of them have sensibility and can independents listen to this in any way with <laughs> open ears? Yeah, the, um, I carry in my wallet a card that lists all the things that they're for that make them seem weird to normal Americans. <laughs> they want to pack the Supreme Court. Didn't work out so well last time. They want to abolish the Electoral College. They want to abolish private health insurance. They want reparations for slavery. They want reparations now for gay couples because until the Supreme Court uh, established that as a, as a right, they couldn't file joint tax returns. So Elizabeth Warren wants reparations for them. Uh, they, they want to forgive all student loans. That's a $1.5 trillion benefit right there, but who's counting? They want the Green New Deal, which means no airplanes or meat. Uh, I'm not making this up. Yeah, I couldn't make that up. It's, it was in the explanatory. So uh, I'm going to need a bigger card. Uh, the, uh, there are good, sensible men and women running for uh, the Democratic nomination. They're having a lot of trouble getting heard because the more strident you are when you have 20-some people on the stage or in the field, the most noisy and lurid stands out. But there's some really good people out there who'd be perfectly fine presidents. They don't have the conservative sensibility, but that's asking a lot. I think back there. Dr. Will, um, I'm a, I, I've, uh, excuse me, I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> My apologies. You talk a lot about the Federalist Papers and you put a lot of emphasis on the Constitution. I'm a very, very strong believer in the Constitution of the United States and the strength of what the, what the Founding Fathers wrote into it and the solidity of it, yet I hear a lot of politicians say that it's a living document and I'd kind of like to hear what your thoughts are about that. By a living document, they mean it should, take, it should be soft wax, taking the shape of whatever strong opinion prevails in the particular era. The problem with that is that's a constitution that cannot constitute. It's a constitution that does not say these are permanent things that are not to be blown about by the gusts of opinion that, that are blowing at any given time in our society. Uh, I believe the Constitution should be read in the light of the Declaration. That is, uh, Lincoln said, uh, who as you say, just said, all my thoughts come from Jefferson and the Declaration. Lincoln said, the Constitution is a frame of silver for the apple of gold, and the apple of gold is the Declaration. That is, I think the Constitution should be read in in the light of the constant commitment to liberty. America is about liberty, and it should be read in the, America's constant commitment to natural rights, and its constant commitment to limited government. That doesn't change. And those are the American premises that I'm trying to, to revive and make the center of, our, of the way we construe and read the Constitution. In the back there. How would you avoid the unintended consequences if you were to have congressional uh, term limits on representatives and senators? How would you avoid the likely problem of the incredibly increasing power of the permanent committee staffs? It's a good question, and I gather it's something you've dealt with in California. Uh, the look. Uh, everything in politics is a trade-off 
for every benefit, there's a, de there's a drawback. I just happen to think that although with term limits you lose some of the institutional memory of some of the great uh, legislators we've had, and you do run the danger that the staffs and the federal bureaucracy, which is permanent, will uh, wield more power over rookie legislators who have to come in and, and hit the ground running as, as freshmen. There's a, there is that danger. I just think the term limits are worth it. That uh, there's no other way to get people to, uh, to, as I say, think of the next generation, not the next election. But don't worry, there's not going to be term limits because the Supreme Court in a 1994 five to four decision, Justice Kennedy as usual, the fifth vote, said that you cannot impose term limits as some states had tried to do on their congressional delegations by statute. You have to amend the Constitution and Congress is never going to send to the states for ratification an amendment that limits their ability to have long careers. So it's not gonna happen. Okay, I think we have enough time for one and maybe two more, but this, this. Um, Mr. Will, you have said that the Republican Party under Donald Trump has become a cult. Uh, I unfortunately agree with that. Uh, I'm curious what you think Ronald Reagan would view or how he would view today's Republican Party under Donald Trump and would he think of it as a cult and how do you think he would uh, interpret what has happened? Well, I, I think he would say what he said about the Democratic Party. I didn't leave it, it, I didn't leave it, it left me. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan would approve of some of the stuff that's being done. Any Republican would have wanted to cut corporate taxes. Barack Obama wanted to cut corporate taxes because ours were anomalous in the world. Any Republican president would have had a deregulatory agenda. Ronald Reagan did. Any Republican president would have selected judges of the sort approved by the Federalist Society, of which I am a card-carrying member. What distinguishes, and I really don't want to get partisan here, but what distinguishes the current president from Ronald Reagan is his manners. And manners matter. My, my wife, the ferocious Presbyterian, hitherto mentioned, was a, before she was Ronald Reagan's last director of White House Communications, she was a speechwriter for him. And he would not allow people to, to attack Democrats. He just didn't do that. Uh, it, it, Ronald Reagan was polite. He was a gentleman. Uh, he was dignified. And uh, try... Well, I'll give you an example. I try to imagine Ronald Reagan overseas quoting a dictator, the head of North Korea, approvingly quoting a dictator calling a former vice president of the United States a low IQ idiot. Now that's, just try to imagine that, it's unimaginable. Because Ronald Reagan knew, and he told his speechwriters, you quoted the end of his, Lincoln's first inaugural address. The paragraph above that begins, we are not enemies, we must not be enemies. And that was Ronald Reagan's approach to politics. Excellent, so with that, our, our time is coming to a close. Uh, on behalf of our, oh, you wanna take one more? Well, it, it, okay, we'll take one more, we'll take one more. Up. Last question. Thank you for being here tonight. I've followed you for many years. My question, maybe somewhat naively, what will it take? We have a divided country. We have people who think the other side are not people. We have labels for ourselves, whether we are liberals or conservatives or pick your other label. Why can't we not start to find out what we both, uh, both sides agree on instead of focusing on what we disagree on? I do not think the American people are angry. Uh, the cable television audience is angry and the talk radio audience is angry and that's a tiny sliver of the country. There are 327 million people in this country 
And at any given time, about 322 million of them are not watching cable television and not listening to talk radio. They're busy fixing the screen door, washing the car, and raising children. Uh, I do think Americans today are united in being sad and embarrassed and exhausted. I think they're sad because they're embarrassed. And I, no, look, no one ever uh, got rich betting against the American people. We're just, we're, we're much too good for that. And we're better than our representatives who are not representing us right now. They're representing a small sliver of the country. And uh, you, someone uh, in, the, in this uh, congested democratic field is gonna figure that out. And uh, it seems to me the American people will, are going to not only welcome, they're gonna insist very soon on a change of tone. And when the change comes, we're gonna wake up to the fact that we got our differences, but good Lord, compared to the, to the 1850s, when we had big differences over whether people could own other people, our differences today are trivial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this evening. Please